This topic, the devil's dungeon, is really talking about a time when Satan is bound. Satan is bound on this planet with nobody to tempt and manipulate, and he has to look at the consequences of his rebellion for 1,000 years. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Tonight our subject is dealing with the uh, topic of the millennium in the Bible, sometimes known as the thousand years. You find this in Revelation 20. It's called the Devil's Dungeon. If you have your Bible, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to read the first few verses here, and it'll give us the foundation for what we're going to study. I want to make sure everybody understands this very important subject. So if you look there in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. Any question about who the devil, Satan, and dragon are? And bound him for how long? A thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit. What is that? And shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years are finished. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and he'll go out to deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. All right, we're going to pause right there. With that as a background for our study, now we're going to get into question one of the lesson. You've got the, um, the picture, and let's learn about this dungeon that the devil is confined to. Question number one in our study. What events mark the beginning of this 1,000-year period? So how do we know? What's the landmarks that begin this time period? You find in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. The second coming of Jesus is when the Lord descends, and it says, and the dead in Christ rise first. Wherever you hear about first, sequentially that means what? Somewhere there's a, a second. And so it's saying blessed and holy are those that are in the first resurrection. You want to be in the first resurrection, friends. That's the resurrection of the saved. And then you read in Revelation 20, verse 4 and 5, and they lived and reigned with Christ for how long? A thousand years. But it tells us the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, you do not find the word millennium in the Bible. Millennium is a composite of two Latin words that simply mean milli, which is a thousand, and annum, which means years. And so the beginning of the 1,000 year period, it starts with what we call the first resurrection, and the end of it is the second resurrection. There are two complete, separate, distinct resurrections. I remember when I first heard this, it kind of surprised me. I thought there was one resurrection at the end of time. The Bible's very clear. Number two, what else will happen in the first resurrection? You read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 53, it says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound and all the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For this corruptible, it goes on to say, must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Just think about that. Some people will never die. There's already a few people who have never died. Who are they? Just two. Enoch and Elijah. The Bible says Elijah, Enoch walked with God and God took him. Elijah went to heaven in a fiery chariot. 
there are going to be others who are alive when Jesus comes that will never experience death. So what happens? When the Lord comes down, all of a sudden we go through this miraculous, complete, total revitalization where we're transformed and we get these glorified eternal bodies and it just happens in the twinkling of an eye. That's quicker than a blink. You can read more about this answer. It's in Philippians 3, verse 21. It says, who will change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. What kind of bodies do we get? Do we turn into ghosts or do we get glorified bodies? What was Jesus' body like when he rose from the dead? Did he tell the disciples to touch him? He was a glorious body. It was a supernatural body, but it was real at the same time. And then he said, do you have anything to eat? I'm hungry. Twice he asked them to feed him. Actually, once he did the cooking when it was by the seashore. The other, so he's making it clear. He says, I'm not an ethereal ghost. Your glorified body is a real body. When God made Adam and Eve, did they have real bodies? Did he intend them to live forever? Does the Bible say in heaven we're going to plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them and build houses and inhabit them and we'll be doing real things. We're not just going to be strumming harps on a cloud somewhere. So our bodies will be like Jesus' glorified body. And again, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8. Then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the brightness of his coming. So when the Lord comes, the dead in Christ that are dead will be caught up those who are saved will be transformed and caught up and what happens to those left behind just like what happened to the devil consumed with the brightness of his coming furthermore revelation 16 18 there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great this is going to be a 15 on the richter scale because it says islands are swallowed up and the mountains are shaked out of their foundations all right, and it goes on to say, every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a, what? A great hail out of heaven, every stone weighing about a talent. Now see that picture? That's somebody who's holding walnut-sized hail. I did an amazing fact one time to find out what was the largest hail ever recorded. In Bangladesh, they had softball-sized hail. Now that can kill you. But still, that's not 75 pounds. Can you imagine the world being pummeled by that kind of hail? Now, when all these things are happening with the coming of Jesus, this marks the beginning of a period where Satan is bound. Revelation 20, verse 1 and 2. And an angel laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, how do you bind a devil? I mean, Samson, they tied him up with all different kinds of ropes and he just broke the ropes. You wonder, is Satan stronger than Samson? How do you tie up a devil? If we knew how, we'd all want to do it, wouldn't we? Satan is not being bound by ropes. It's the chain that's being referred to. He says the angel had a great chain in his hand. It's talking about a chain of circumstances. Now, that bottomless pit is a very interesting word and this is what throws people. It comes from a Greek word that you find other places in the Bible. You ever heard the word abyss? It comes from the Greek word abusos. Sounds similar, right? That word abusos, it means the devil is chained where he cannot do anything. It's isolation for him. The same word is used in Luke chapter 8, verse 31. You remember there's this uh, man who's possessed with a legion of demons. And the demons say to Jesus, do not cast us out into the same exact word, abusos. Demons and the devil do not want to be cast into nothingness. The devil wants to possess somebody. He will possess a serpent. The devils in this story possess pigs. They'll possess people. They want to tempt. The devil's a workaholic with nothing to do. It's torture for him. And so the bottomless pit is this planet. For 1,000 years, Satan is going to be bound down here in darkness with his demons, with no humans alive. Why? Because when Jesus comes back, what direction do the dead in Christ go? Oh, the living saints are transformed, and what direction do they go? We will be caught up 
Remember, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again, receive you unto myself that where I am you may be. So we're all going back to the mansions he's prepared when he comes, right? What happens to the wicked who are alive when he comes? The devil and uh, all the devil's going to run from his presence. All the wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. How many people are alive on the planet at that point? Nobody. Who does the devil have to tempt? Him and his demons. They're going to be chained on this dark planet. Question number three. In what condition will the earth be left after this devastating earthquake and hailstorm that begin the 1,000 years? Let's let the Bible explain itself. Isaiah 24, verse 19. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty. He makes it waste. He turneth it upside down. The earth is utterly broken down. How many people are on the earth? It's empty. Read now in Jeremiah 4, verse 23. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form, and boy, now you read that, you might think, oh, he's talking about creation, because it's the same wording, but it's not what he's talking about. Keep reading. I beheld in the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled. And there was no man, all the birds of heaven were fled. The fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. What was the condition of Israel after Nebuchadnezzar came and left? Desolate, cities broken down. Didn't we just read that? Read Jeremiah 25, verse 33. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. Is that clear? They shall not be lamented, neither ga gathered nor buried. Why is there nobody to gather them or to bury them? Because there's nobody alive. Now, I'll tell you why this is such an important subject. I need both hands. I've got to put down my clicker for this. Many dear Christians believe the Tim LaHaye left behind scenario of final events, which say, and again, we may just respectfully disagree, but they say that the secret rapture takes place seven years before Jesus actually touches the earth. They go back to heaven, great tribulation, people still alive on earth during the tribulation. Then at the end of that time, Jesus comes down and the millennial reign is here on earth and then at the end of that millennial reign, the wicked are slain and we just occupy the earth. In that scenario, where is the earth completely vacated from all life? It doesn't fit. It never happens. It, it doesn't fit the scheme in the Bible of what it's describing. And so this is what Protestants used to believe for about 1,500 years and it's getting eclipsed by Hollywood productions now tells us that the slain of the Lord covered the earth. There is no man. I turn the earth upside down. It's utterly empty. The cities are all broken down. They've all fled from the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. There's no one to lament or bury them or mourn. They're all gone. But we're living and reigning with Christ. Satan is bound on this planet. You know, in the, um, the Greek Old Testament, uh, it's the same Old Testament as Hebrew, except it's in Greek, called the Septuagint, when it says the earth is void, it uses the word abusos. It calls this planet the same thing. And that verse in Jeremiah uses the word abusos. The earth is an, was an abyss. Satan is bound on this planet with nobody to tempt and manipulate. And he has to look at the consequences of his rebellion for 1,000 years. That's a long prison sentence. All right, number four. Where will the saints be during the 1,000 years and what will they be doing? All right, now we're going to jump to heaven. It's going to be a prettier picture. John 14, verse 3, Jesus said, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you might be also. He's taking us to where he is, where he's told his disciples he was going. Is it clear we're going up? Yet the left behind scenario says that we spend the millennium here on earth reigning over the wicked. I don't know about you, but I have no aspirations to reign over the wicked. Uh, that would be really strange. Think about that. 
that the righteous are here on earth, they've got glorified bodies and they're reigning over the wicked that still marry, have babies and die. It just, it, it just seems uh, really strange to make that fit. Revelation 20 verse four, what are we doing in heaven when it says we live and reign with Christ? It tells